Hello fellow simmers, welcome to another video from FS Pro. Today I'm taking a look at the internal virtual cockpit representation of the Airbus A330 as envisaged by JAR Design. So you can see me here on the ground, runway 08 at uh, RAF Bryce Norton again. That's not relevant to what we're trying to do. All I'm going to do is take a look around the internals of the cockpit. The view I've got at the moment is the pilot's view. Let's cycle through a few of the others that I have just for a quick look. So there's an external view and another and another and now my internal views again. So here from the cockpit let's take a look at the overhead view the rear overhead view, the central consoles view, the PFD and the ND, MCDU, pedestal, MCDU for the first officer and the first officer's position. All of which very interesting but actually a bit boring and bland without any of the monitors lit up or anything going on. So let's change that. I'm going to pop up to the overhead and I'm going to fire up the batteries first of all and then the APU. I'm going to set the air conditioning controls because if I don't I'll just get constant complaints from the back about passengers complaining about it being too hot or too cold or whatever it is. So we'll just wait for the APU to fire up. I should be able to tell that on the front screen here it says APU avail. And there we are, now it is. So that's good and all the systems here are starting to fire up. I'll just go down to the MCDU as well and do some basic information on the init page so we can get that showing a decent representation of how it might appear for a normal flight. Align the IRS's flight numbers, it really doesn't matter, but let's put uh, RA123. Uh, cost index of 30 for no other reason than it seems to work whenever I put it in. Cruise flight level 31,000. We're not doing a flight. This really doesn't matter, but... Oops, that's meant for the block. There we go. Okay. So that's okay. Let's have a quick look. See how the screens are firing up, coming along nicely. Um... I'd like to wait for the screens to fire up and, and show the full view. It might take a bit of time to do that though because of course we're waiting for the IRS to align. Let me cycle through some of my views again. Okay, and let's take a closer look now at some of the things that we can see. Here on the overhead, for example, a regular complaint I get from some of my fellow simmers is that the cockpit here appears really dark. Um, I understand what they mean. I think you've got to have your graphics card and or monitor set up in a certain way to, to get the best of the graphics in this A330. Here on my system, and hopefully this will show equally as well on YouTube, um, the colouring, the shadowing, the difference between dark and light seems appropriate and it, it seems fairly good. And I have to say, I find the textures in here to be remarkably good. So here, for example, if we look at the texturing on the panels, that looks exactly as I would expect it to see in real life. Not that I've been in many cockpits of an A330, I have not but the effect here certainly is very good. And likewise here, if we look at the overhead, 
we can see that it's, it's, it's weathered. It's a little bit used and worn. You can see chip marks off the paint here. And that seems wholly appropriate. And if we zoom in a little bit so we can get closer, we can see that we can really get close before some of the lettering here starts to sort of fail a little bit, gets a bit blocky, but you have to be really close for that effect to to take hold. So that's pretty impressive, I think. Let's uh, slide across a bit more. Yes, we can see now that the lettering starting to fail a little bit. It's perhaps not situated perfectly. I would expect that lettering to be slightly above this switch, for example. But overall, the effect really pleasing, really good. I look here at some of the switches, the guarded ones. Let's uh, lift the guard and yeah, pretty impressive stuff. Maybe you could argue that the guard looks a bit thin once it's raised, but I think that's nitpicking. Overall, it does what it seems to need to do. So back down to the full view, everything looks good. Clickable spots as I would expect. Uh, these uh, switches for this comms panel up here uh, light up if they are pressed uh, and pop out. So if you press them they pop out, they light up. If you press them again they recess and the light goes off. Good stuff. Let's have a quick look at these switches here because this is one thing that I wasn't sure about because I mean the switches kind of look good but then again you know the, the worn effect here is good but the actual plastic itself for me this it looks too chalky it doesn't look like uh, a plastic normal switch set that I might expect to see now maybe that's re more realistic than what I'm expecting to see but as I say to me it just looks chalky I would imagine that it would be perhaps a bit more plastic a bit shinier than what we are seeing here. Nitpicking? Possibly. But then the representation here is so good. It invites this form of close examination, I think. OK, what else can we see? Not so much there. Let's go to the rear overhead view. Um, not a great deal I would add, other than, here we are, you can see the effect of the lighting. So at the moment it's off and I switch it on and I do that by left clicking, holding and dragging to the right to rotate the knob. You can see that that light gets brighter. That, that's one of the wonderful side effects of the, the HDR that we can achieve that effect. It's really nice. We'll take a look at that again with a nighttime view of the interior of the cockpit. Other than that, I don't think there's anything else here that I particularly need to look at. Um, we can see the nice effect of the shadowing here inside of the cockpit. Uh, the glare shield inside the Jar Design A330 doesn't seem to work as well as the glare shield in some of the other aircraft that I use in Prepared, for example. It's very common to get shadows coming off of the knobs and dials here in the Jar Design A330, less so if I'm using the Airbus in the Aerosoft representation for the A318 to A321 series, for example. Yes, they're different aircraft, but the positioning of the glare shield and so on is fairly similar. What else can I see on this view that I would like to talk about? Ah, the A cars down here. Now, there's no getting away from it really. When I'm looking at this aircraft, I'm comparing against the Aerosoft representation of the uh, the A320 series that I'm really quite well versed with. Now, the Aerosoft implementation hasn't implemented the ACARS, but the Jar Design A330 has. And this is really useful, especially when you're in the cruise and you're looking to configure the MCDU for landing because you can just make the request through here and you'll get the, QA, uh, sorry, the METAR for your destination airport. This is a bit like having text capacity inside the aircraft in the sky. Good stuff. I like that. 
really nice touch. What else can I see here that I would comment on? Not so much really. Um, let's take a look at the next view. Close up of the PFD and the ND which isn't really very useful until we got something to show so we'll leave that to run for a little while. The MCDU, yeah, now an interesting thing about this, I love the text on here, it's nice, it's clean, it's clear, it doesn't suffer from some of the vagaries I've seen in other implementation of Airbuses, so that's nice, I like that. When I come down here to the buttons as well to enter detail, uh, there is one little idiosyncrasy that I found. If I press like keys like F or G or H, you might see there's a little bounce effect. That's nice. I like that. But I'll just clear those out. If I then try and do that for the N, or the E, or the S, or the W key, note, no such effect. Nor for the X, nor for the Y, or the T. Uh, there is for the D, and the I, and the J, and the O, but not the T, Y. I don't know why. So... There's a really odd effect here where some of these buttons, the push down effect is well represented and yet not for others. Let's clear that away again. If I click on some of the other options here on the MCDU, you can see that again, we've got that push down effect and it's well represented. So I like that. Um, if I come down, uh, let me just put it back onto the upland page. Actually, maybe that's not the best page, the init page. If I come down here to the numbers, again, notice there's no click down effect here. So I'm not sure what the thinking is here, Jar Design. You, you've done a great job with some of the buttons, and I don't know, did we run out of time before we finished the others? Was it just an oversight? Um, it just seems an odd thing. Every time we make a flight in this aircraft, we're going to use the MCDU in almost all occasions. And we're going to come across this idiosyncratic behaviour. So I, I guess I'd be surprised if it wasn't picked up in the beta testing. Uh, OK, so let's move on to something else. I'll just clear the MCDU away again. There we go. And in fact, while I'm here, I'm just going to turn on the radio stack because that's not turned on by default. So the overview of the pedestal now. Um, what can I say about this? It behaves pretty much as you would expect with a rather odd way that X-Plane has of rotating knobs where you position over it, you left click, and then you move the mouse to the left or the right to rotate that dial to get the effect that you're after. It works okay for those things where you're trying to do lights. It's not quite so good when you come down here and want to tune radios, for example. So here on the comms stack, we've got the button on the top, but actually if you want to change the larger numbers for the frequency you're looking to change, you, you have to move out a little bit there and you get the larger sized indication for the thing that you want to change. And clicking on that and then moving to the left or to the right again makes the change that you're after same for the large setting takes a bit of getting used to. Those of us who are used to working in FSX or prepared are accustomed to using the scroll wheel to that and getting nice digital surety as we change the position of a control. Not so here in X-Plane, whole different thing to get used to and I have to say it feels a bit more clunky in X-Plane too. Not a problem related to the jar design itself, although some manufacturers of sim aircraft for X-Plane have introduced their own capa uh, capability for adjusting any of the things that are accessible via knobs and dials. The other thing I would point out here is related to the speed brake. So here on the speed brake, if I hover over the top of it, I get a hand icon. If I left click, it changes to a gripping hand. And you would think from this point here then that I can change the setting for the speed brake. Well, if I left click and make a pull toward the rear, you can see nothing happens at all. Click it again, move to the right. Oh, and uh, for some bizarre reason, it's now clicked back. So there we go. Spoiler click. fall. 
move to the right and the spoilers will move so let's click and move forward nothing click move to the left and now it will go forward one or more positions so again there's that idiosyncratic explain behavior if you want to change the positioning you need to grasp it and move to the left or to the right to either rotate a dial or in this case to move a control forward and backward. It's counterintuitive. The user affordance for this is terrible. There is one nice feature that they added to this to make things a bit simple, or a bit simpler, pardon me, which is that if you move forward slightly, you'll see I get a forward pointing arrow. And if I click now, you spoilers see there's arms, the spoilers. And if I want to disarm the spoilers, Believe Spoilers it or disarm. not, I have to move forward until I've got that forward pointing arrow and click it again. So it's behaving as a toggle, but there's no indication that that is going to come back with this time. It's just a toggle state. Again, strange user affordance behavior there. Over here to the flaps control, and if I've set the scene for you now, well, <laughs> what can I say? Um, so over here again, I've got the hand left click I've got the grasping hand pull it backward nothing happens push it forward oh flaps four flaps oh, so zero apparently something did happen so I'll click on this pull it backwards release I'm waiting I'm waiting nothing hover back over it click nothing move it forward and now flaps it's gone to four. flaps full how has it done that? Why has it done that? If I go forward a bit further, let's listen again. Flaps zero. <laughs> so by grasping and moving the flaps forward, flaps that full. sets it to flaps, flaps full, although zero. there is no animation to indicate that's the case. And if I go a bit further forward and release, it sets it to zero, which is crazy. So let's see what happens now if I grasp and move to the right. Nothing is the answer. Grasp and move to the left. Oh, we've flaps got flaps full. full. But flaps, flaps zero, zero again as soon as I release. And again, there's no animation here to show you what has actually happened. So maybe we get a little arrow if we move beyond... But no, we don't. So the only way i found to reliably make use of the flaps is actually via a button on my joystick. And that is precisely how I do it. So very idiosyncratic behavior here between the speed brakes and the flaps. Um, I think that is hopefully something that Jar Design are working on because as it's modeled now, there's definitely room for improvement. Over to the First Officer's MCDU now. And the First Officer's MCDU shows exactly the same information that's on the captains and vice versa. In fact, let me go to an overview now. Here, on this MCDU, if I try to change to the perf page, for example, nothing happens. If I change to it on the captain's MCDU, you'll see that it changes over here in the first officer's position as well. If I come down closer to the first officer's MCDU, <laughs> sorry, MCDU, um, too many Ds there, you'll find that none of the buttons on here are clickable, accessible, or usable. So... Mm. I can understand why they've done it. I guess it's certainly easier to do where you can only have the one MCDU. But it does prevent you from doing some of the real world procedures where, oh, I don't know, something like a takeoff, the captain's MCDU would be showing one page and the first officer's would be showing another. Also, notice there's another MCDU back here. It's not used at all. It doesn't light up. None of the buttons are accessible. Um, it's as much use to us here as a handbrake in a canoe. First officer's position, much as we would expect to see. By now, I hoped that the IRSs would have aligned, and I've just realised it's because I haven't turned on the ADIRS. So let's do that. Again, we've got that odd switching position going on with the uh, with X-Plane, with, with the Jar Designs A330. It's very easy to over-rotate a knob or a control and you end up with a position that you didn't want it in. 
practice required, certainly for me. OK, the ADI, ADIRS is now on, and hopefully then we'll get the screen light up with the relevant info shortly. What else would I show you? Let's take a look at the, uh, the rest of the cabin. Or at least I would if I could get it to move. There we are. Um, a control here for opening the window. Not active inside the sim, I'm afraid. Does it make a big difference? Not really. But um, you know, if I look at the Airbus A330, they have a sorry the, the Aerosoft Airbus A320. They have a control for opening the window. They animated it too. I guess it just shows the, the length that the developers were keen to go to to provide a realistic and immersive experience. Um, we have got sunshades here though that operate much as you would expect. So another idiosyncratic behaviour here is that if you want to pull down the shade for the front window you need to grab and pull or push and release to get it into the position that you want. Great. But the control over here you need to find the hotspot click and then it doesn't matter whether you hold or whether you just tap it the once it moves throughout the whole motion in one fell swoop that's your lot moving beyond uh, the seat I think and the material on it is all very well modeled uh, the arm here is stowed but the kind of effect of the plastic and everything towards the rear, rear here very well modeled that's nice the seat belt appearing over the top here is a little bit one-dimensional or two-dimensional for my liking compared to the rest of what we can see. Everything else seems to be really rather nicely modelled here. Nicely done. See there's another spot here for a sunshade but actually you can't activate it. So you can do this one here. You can't do that one there. I'm not sure why that differentiation has been made, but there we are. So same with the sunscreen here on the captain's side, and there's also another one you can deploy here in the centre. That's just a click and drag, the same as the ones for the main screen. Um, that had reminded me of something else whilst I was here. It's now gone clean out of my mind. Oh, here we are. The desk or the slide up portion that they have here. Um, as you can see, you activate it by grabbing a hold of the handle and pulling it clear. And then I couldn't for the life of me discover how I could click on the end to push it back. And no amount of clicking and pushing would help. It wasn't until I realized that you have to go into the middle of the tray and then click and then push uh, and you have to do that once and then come back and grab here and push again that you could actually stow it and it takes quite a few movements too. Uh, again some rather odd behaviour but, but, but that's the way that it is. Another final thing here or another final thing, it's either a final thing or it's another thing. Let's call it another thing. You have a checklist here which is uh, just intended to be as an aid memoir really for you for doing the processes that you need to do to get the A330 successfully into the air and then back on the ground. I have found this difficult to work with because when it gives you an entry example here, cockpit prep, you have no indication from JAR Design at all about what cockpit prep involves and if you ask them they will direct you to the FCOMs for the A330 but then the A330 by JAR Design doesn't model everything that's in the FCOM, so you end up having to try and make something up for yourself. Uh, more on that when I get to the documentation section of the review in a later video. Okay, so we have got everything lit up now. I haven't got the engine started though, so let's do that quickly as well. Starting engine 2. Starting engine two. While that's starting, we'll take a quick look here at the centre. Can't see a lot going on here yet. 
the fact they can't see anything going on at all. Let's have a look at the overhead. The APU is on. The Let's turn the fuel pumps on, shall we? That would be helpful. And the APU battery as well. OK. Let's try and start the engine again, shall we? So that will start engine one. Because Starting engine, engine one. Engine one fires up the hydraulics that powers the brakes as well. Anything happening this time? No. Nothing at all. OK, why not? I've got enough fuel. Double check that the APU is on, it's available. Ah, the APU bleed is why. Uh, now, this is an interesting uh, thing, this. I wonder if it confuses Airbus A330 pilots that have gravitated from the A320 series. In the A320, that is just about where the APU bleed is for the A320. In the A330, as you can see, that's probe and window heat. So let's turn that off. And I'm going to turn on the APU bleed up here. Now, when I do that, um, let's come down to the front view again. You can see that I was going to say nothing much is happening here, but actually the N3 is rising and it is now beginning to start up. OK, so the start is working. Uh, th there was an odd behaviour with this where I could do this. I could then turn the engine off. And then the engine would automatically start when I put the APU bleed on. A strange set of circumstances which um, I will repeat when I get to my final wash-up video in this series of the review of the A330. Anyway, engine one is starting up now. How are we looking? I guess in the first instance, I am... Um a little surprised to see that the indications here are for engine 2 and not for engine 1 at all. Notice I'm overspeeding here as well. Um, this is some of the idiosyncratic behaviour I was talking about before. If I come down to this switching panel you'll note I've selected to start engine 1 not engine 2 so there's absolutely no reason why engine 2 should be attempting to start and indeed over speed as is indicated here. So what I'll do is I'll cycle engine two off. Starting engine two. Or on. <laughs> I've moved it to the on position and you might have heard it whine then as it's now going to go down to the idle position. Really, really odd. I'm going to move engine one switch to off. and then move it to on. Starting engine Let's see one. see what happens now. Fuel flow is increasing as I would expect. N1 is rising. In fact, N1 now is beyond 20%, uh, so that would be fine. That's an indicating uh, an available engine. The fuel flow is about right, and it took no time at all. There is a really odd behavior here between the APU bleed selection on the overhead and the engine start procedures. Just one of those idiosyncratic things. OK, so with those started, the only reason I started the engine was so that we could get these um, information panels showing up here on the EFIS. So that's done. Let's go back now to take a look, closer look, at some of the knobs, dials, switches that we have on this aircraft. Um, bear with me a second, I'm just going to switch to another set of views. OK, so I've taken some close-up views of some of the uh, knobs and dials and details on inside of the virtual cockpit. So let's take a quick look around those and see what we can see. One of the things I'd point out to you here is some of the detail on these knobs. If you can make it out, you can see that even the plastic, the, the texture of the plastic is beautifully modelled on the knob here and indeed over here. And you'll see it now. I'm going to scan across the front of the FCU 
and you can take a bit of a closer look for yourself. A marvellous representation, I think. Really, really nicely done. The uh, chrome switches here and the way that they're recessed behind the panel, I think, wonderfully modelled as well. A really nice effect. Going down towards the first office's MCDU, getting a closer look at some of the screens and some of the other detail available. Again, lovely, lovely textures. Graphically, I think, very involving, very immersive, nicely modelled. Across to the, the ACARS, um, one thing I was really impressed here is not only that the ACARS is available, I mean, that's great, I think that's a, a really worthwhile and useful thing, but even looking at the modelling here of the deposit drive or Phillips screws, beautifully done, and the little, I guess they're like plastic fill studs here, beautifully modelled, really nicely done, excellent attention to detail. Let's take a scan back across the pedestal. Again, wonderfully modelled, nicely done. And let's take a look up now towards the overhead. As we move closer in, you can see that some of the text, which really is graphically represented on the overhead panel, starts to break down a little, but the text on the light or the lit sections of the switches modelled really well. The chrome effect that they have on the switches, I think, is wonderfully done. Uh, and yet I think that the modelling for the landing light switch, by comparison, relatively poor. Screw fittings again here, beautifully modelled, I think, really nicely done. Chalky knobs again. <laughs> in isolation, that's a revolting statement. Maybe I should change that in the edit. Lovely textures, lovely detailing, really impressive stuff. Down to the light switch uh, section here for the first officer. Again, the nicely modelled. Uh, you need to grasp and then push or pull the relevant switches to to get them to operate. Scan across toward the rear of the cabin. Let's move our way through the door into the cabin itself. So there's the galley area at the front. Here's the first class section. Now for me, this first class section looks like something that I might have expected to see in a 1980s uh, movie of airplane or something. The kind of horrible uh, velour or dreadlon effect on the seats. Um, so I'm not sure of the colouring or the material and that stuff that they've got on the floor looks like the lino effect in my granny's kitchen. But <laughs> other than that, uh, moving on through, I mean, this is something ordinarily, of course, we wouldn't waste any uh, great deal of time here inside the cockpit section. It's something that can be modelled really well inside X-Plane, but uh, it's a nice to have. It's, it's nothing that we'd really uh, get overly vexed about, I think, one way or another. That JAR designed and modelled it at all is uh, useful and certainly for external shots of the aircraft very nicely done. See the size of the second class cabin as distinct from the business class or first class section, uh, the higher density seating and so on, all the way back to the rear to the galley section. Okay, let's pop back to the front and this time what I'm going to do is get us into a night type mode. So using the wonderful ability 
inside X-Plane I'm going to advance time there's the sun going down until there we go we're set and a night time setting so note now that even though everything is backlit and the monitors are on uh, it really is quite difficult to see your way around now in X-Plane we have got the aviation flashlight which as you can see casts a red coloured beam wherever you move your mouse pointer let's go to the overhead you can see there how that works um, red coloured I suppose it's going to uh, save your eyesight from uh, glare and from getting washed out by bright lights coming into your eyes and rendering your night vision very poor as a result let's have a quick look around internal lights we have got the central light and the dome light but we can turn those on for now in fact I'm going to turn that central light off because it's a bit overly bright and what I'll do is I'll come over here and let's turn on some of these lights for the map reading lights and so on foot warmers we're not too worried about so there we go nice effect with those ones there and floodlights which should appear on the front panel there we are so that's the floodlights lit up now and integrated lights as well let's pump those up let's we get to a better view on the pedestal so I can increase that there we go that's better floodlights I'll leave them as they are now I've done that I think I can turn the radiation flashlight off we don't need that now and there we can see the effect then of the lighting inside the cabin and how it affects various parts of the internal perspective the reading light I promised you earlier on we will take a look at again let's do that okay and you can see how the reading light now lights up the first officers and, and the captain's seat as appropriate depending where you're wanting the lights let's turn those off back down again you can see that they're now rendered to darkness so the dynamic lighting inside the virtual cockpit I think absolutely fantastic I really like that let us take a look again at the cockpit views I was showing earlier here we are and let's cycle through these again but this time with a nighttime view perspective beautifully represented I think the nighttime lighting is really well done really well done you also get the uh, feeling here of just how much the screens can be burned out when you look at them now you can see that they're probably uh, far too strongly lit and there's another little effect I wanted to show you if I can get to it now oops on uh, a couple of the the knobs that we can see in fact there is one there I can just about make it out you can see a little dotted light around the tops of the floodlight and the integrated lights there really really nice touch and again really well done see you there around the ecam lights as well quick look at the overhead panel again
again you can see how some of the text that is on the uh, texture for the panels themselves is not as good as the text that's written uh, as, a, as, as a font I suppose by the guys at Jar Design. An adjustment here for the brightness of the PFD. Let's adjust that. So that, that's a kind of bit of a shame there because as you can see as we're putting up the brightness for this that kind of grey muzziness in the background remains as a grey muzziness. I would have hoped that by dialing this down we would have lost the muzziness but kept the brightness of the colour uh, but we don't. Um, in the grand scheme of things not a big deal but compared to how the rest of the lighting is done uh, comparatively perhaps a bit of a shame. So there's a cockpit set for night time. If we go and have a quick look at the cabin you can see that the lighting for that is the same as it was before. No change there at all. I haven't found a way to adjust the cabin lights either so this pretty much is what we've got. Back into the cabin uh, onto the overhead and I will dispense with oops, those lights Turn them off. And back down to the pedestal Turn off the floodlights, turn off the integrated lights as well and I will cycle this back through to daytime Seems to be taking a long time to get there. There we go. Okay. Leave some nice shadows on the FCU and across the front of the displays. So there we are, I mean that concludes this part of my review of the Jar Design A330. Overall I think the textures are absolutely incredible. Again they've done a magnificent job in certain places. Looking at the, uh, the effect overall as well I think it's an incredibly good job. They've clearly spent some time working on the virtual cockpit for the A330 and I commend them highly for doing that. The plastics are well represented, the glass is well represented, the shadows work extremely well. Um, overall the effect really really good. If I'm looking on the negative side I guess things like having to put up with the standard X-plane way of operating, knobs and dials, mm, you know, there's definitely an improvement that could be made there and to the benefit of the aircraft. In terms of the idiosyncratic behaviour of things like the uh, flap settings and for the speed brakes, that's the kind of stuff I hope that they would have picked up in beta testing uh, and have been able to fix. Um, and I hope that they'll be able to fix stuff like that in a subsequent update. Overall though, hugely impressive piece of work. I really like the virtual cockpit on this uh, aircraft. I'm quite happy to live with some of the idiosyncrasies because I think it looks so very good. So uh, out of five stars, oh, mm, oh crikey, and I'm really loath to, to give it anything less than five stars because overall it's remarkably good. If I was scoring it out of ten stars I'd probably give it nine. If I'm scoring it out of five I'm probably going to give it five stars here. The internal representation, the look, really, really nice. Yes, there are areas that they can improve on. Does it detract massively from the sim? No. And that's why I'm going with five stars for this. So that concludes my review of the virtual cockpit and internal graphics for the Jar Design A330. Watch out for my next video where I'll talk about another part of the Jar Design A330. My review of it will consume five, maybe six videos in total. I look forward to seeing you 
in the next video. Until then, thanks for watching.